Shall we pray? Father, we can never approach your throne too much. For, Lord, we are in need of prayer. We ask in a special way that as we enter into this special time of study together as a church family, that you will anoint us with your spirit like never before. You have great and marvelous things that we know not. And, Lord, we want our eyes to be open so that we can see the marvelous things that you have for us. Abide with us now, we pray, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. You know, it is truly a blessing for you and I to be a part of the family of God. Amen. amen. I believe with all of my heart that time cannot continue much longer. You believe that? I believe that in the midst of this, that God himself wants to do something very special with uh, his worldwide church, not just uh, in, 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 a, in a simple way, but very clearly, God has identified in his word that he wants to do something very special. In fact, turn with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 60. What book did I say? <clears throat> We're going to Isaiah chapter 60. And we want to notice what the Bible says here. We're going to do something special today, but we have a two part in what we're doing. So we're going to lay a foundation. Uh, let's go to the book of Isaiah, the 60th chapter. And we want to notice what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 60. And when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. amen. Now, I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. As I'm looking at what's happening, I recognize that the devil's plan, he has to try to desensitize us to make us feel like we deserve to live. Now, the devil's very tricky in his, his methods and his work. You know that right now we're in a generation that thinks that God deserve, that, 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 that God, that God, that we deserve God giving us life. We don't deserve anything from God. What we deserve is misery and destruction and death. But Jesus came that we might have life and that we might have it how? More abundantly. That's the mercy and the gift of God. The Bible rightly says that life is a gift from God, the life giver. And I'm thankful for that. What do you say? The fact that we can come to church today is a gift. The fact that we have a Bible is a gift. The fact that we have an opportunity to live life is a gift. And God wants us to recognize all of these gifts from the gift giver that we might become his friend. What do you say? Amen. Now, very soon, something is going to take place in this earth that is going to cause seven day Adventists to take the notice of the entire world. That our little church that right now today is considered insignificant, there are things in motion right now today that is designed to bring us to the forefront of the world's events. And if that is to be, what must take place inside of us? Look at Isaiah 60. I'm going to turn our screen there. We're going to look at a, a, a text in just a moment. But the Bible tells us if ever there was a time for seven day Adventists to arise and shine, it is now. We're going to see that the same plan that God had for ancient Israel, that God has for us as Seventh-day Adventists. Look what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 60. We want to begin in verse 1. You're there, amen? amen. Let's read that together. The Bible says, Arise. Arise. What else? Shine. Why? For thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is what? Now, I want us to see that this is a prophecy concerning God's people. That Israel was supposed to be the light of the world. Light gets attention when we're in darkness. When you cut your headlights on, one of the reasons for them is not only to see in front of you, but that somebody can see you. Do you know that people who don't have headlights and they're in the middle of the uh, dark street can be hit very easily. But the light gives attention to who we are. In fact, we'll find the inspiration says something very interesting here. It says in Christian service. 155, Lord, anoint your words, we've opened it. In Jesus' name, amen. It says, our people, speaking of seven Adventists, have been regarded as, what's the next two words? Too insignificant to be worthy of what? Notice, but a change will come. So the prophet says that right now we may be considered insignificant of notice, but a change will what? I'm telling you, it's happening right now. Inspiration says, Concerning this, the Christian world is now making movements, and I promise you this is so, which will necessarily bring 
commandment keeping people into what? Now, I told you last week and we'll talk about a little bit more uh, this week. But I told you about project what? Talk to me. 2025, which is a a project that is designed to bring the government into full view and to notice. And it's a change of the government the way it now is. The Christian world has put that project together and it is actually going to bring commandment keeping people into guess what? Prominence. There is a constant supplanting of God's truth by theories and false doctrines of human origin. Movements are being set on foot to do what? Enslave the consciences of those who would be loyal to God. The law-making powers will be against God's people. Every soul will be what? Here's a form of government that the Christian world is going to bring to view. That's going to cause every biblical commandment-keeping people to be placed and tested. This time is just before us. And in the midst of this, God wanted his people to arise and do what? I'm going to tell you something. God is getting ready to do something to this church at Richland. It's not just the world church. This church at Richland, God has given a vision of what's going to happen right here. And this vision is going to get the attention of the entire world. This little church, God is going to use as a beacon of light to reach this entire community. I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of this jet of light. Amen. I want to be a part of what God's going to do. In fact, it's going to be so special that the Bible identifies it that when darkness covers the earth and gross darkness to people, God is going to do something for us. Look at verse 2. It says, For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness uh, uh, of the people, but the Lord shall do what? Arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen where? Upon thee. Verse 3. Now, what's going to be the result? It says, And the Gentiles shall what? Come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of what? Now, notice what the Bible says. It says, The Gentiles shall come to that light. What is a Gentile? What is it talking about? This is the one who is not a believer in the true God. This is the worldling. This is the heathen. The Bible says that the Gentiles are going to come to the light. Now, I'm going to tell you something. We're going to see Gentiles, worldlings, just walk into this church. We're going to see this church filled to capacity. But it says not just not just the common. It says even kings shall come. Now, what is a king? There's a ruling power. It's talking about someone who is at the lowest part of society as the world considers it or someone who's at the highest place in society. Do you know the inspiration teaches us that very soon that the entire world on all levels is going to be beating their pathway, not just to the door of seven of Venice, but to this door looking for answers. The queen of Sheba is coming. The queen of Sheba came and pressed Solomon for questions and answers. And Solomon had answers from God. And do you know that God is trying to get Richland seven of Venice church ready for the Queen of Sheba. She's coming. And she's not coming because she wants to see the pews that we have. She's not coming to look at the light fixtures and the wood. She's not coming, big brothers and sisters, because she's heard of the forms and the fashions that we put together. That's not why she's coming. She's coming because she needs answers and she doesn't have them. She's coming because there's a light that God has given us in our dwelling. But if we don't have that light, she will come and go. But now, my brothers and sisters, I want her to come and bow at the feet of Jesus and say the half has never been told. Now, the only way that she can say that is that the light is in our dwelling. In fact, look at what he goes on to say. Verse four, Isaiah 60, verse four. What does the Bible say in verse four? It says, lift up thine eyes round about. Look, look around Richlands. Look what it says. And see, all they gather themselves where? Where? Together. What are they going to do? They Come to thee. Why are they coming to this church? It says, thy son shall come from far and thy daughter shall be nursed where? Now, I want to ask you a question. Now, the Gentiles come from without. But where do the sons and daughters come from? Talk to me. From within. Do you know the seven at Venice themselves will come from other denominations, from other churches to this little church? That the worldlings will come, the Baptists and the Methodists and the Catholic and the atheists, they're going to come to Richlands looking for light. God's going to bring them. And the Bible says that even the the, the only family is going to be nursed by thy side. Verse 5 says, then thou shalt see and flow together and thine heart shall do what? Fear and be what? Enlarge. Why? Because the abundance of the sea shall be what? We're going to see multitudes come to this church converted to God. 
it says that they're going to be converted. The abundance. And it goes on to say, the abundance of the sea, it says in verse 5 going on, it says, unto thee, thy forces of the, the forces of the Gentiles shall do what? Shall come unto thee. It's almost like if you live in a country, you know what you don't do in the summertime when you open your door. You don't cut the light on. Now, do you know what happens in the summertime when you cut the light on in your house and everything is dark outside? What happens to the bugs? All those bugs are coming on the inside. Now, I got something that we do. Before we let people outside the house, we cut the light off on the inside. <laughs> Then we let them go out because then the, the, the bugs, the, the all insects always like to go to the light. Now, my brothers and sisters, that way is true with souls. True seekers for truth go where light is or at least where they think that light is. And my brothers and sisters, when they come, if it's not real light, they'll leave. But if it is real light, they'll stay. But light is not just what we lip. Light is what we live. In him was life. And his life was the light of men. Do you know that the truths that we preach must be lived out by what we practice if we're going to stand for God? You know, there used to be a song in the world and they got it right. This is one, one of the maybe the best songs that, that that writer wrote. You should practice what you preach. You know what our problem is? We don't practice what we preach. And my brothers and sisters, today, God is trying to wake us up because a great change is going to take place and God is going to use this little church. He's going to make up a team, but in order to be that church, something must happen to us. We cannot be that church in the condition we're in right now. And I'm not talking about the world church. That's true. But I'm talking about our local church. I'm talking about right here at Richlands. Something must happen to us called revival and what else? Reformation. Reformation. Now look what the prophet says concerning this. It says, the Lord does not now work to bring many souls, where? Into the truth. Now, who does not do that? It says, the Lord does not now work. Now, if the Lord doesn't do it, do you think you can do it? Yes or no? Not effectively. It said, the Lord does not now work to bring many souls into the truth. Why? Why does God not bring so many souls into the truth into his church? Why? It says, because of the because of the church members. Now I want to stop. I just want us to investigate and analyze that for a moment. Why is it that God does not work to bring so many people from rich lands into our church? Why not? Because of the what? Now, does that mean that the church members are devil worshipers? Is that, that what we are? Is it because we're devil worshipers? No, that's not what it's saying. But there's something that God is trying to do. And there are two things here. Now, look what it says. Number one. It says because of the church members. So the reason why is because of church members. Now, there are two reasons which are really one. What's the first reason of why God can't bring so many into the church? What's wrong with us as church members? Is it because we don't have form or fashion in the church? What is it? Talk to me, somebody. So what is the first thing that needs to happen inside church members? So the reason why that many are not being brought into the church is because church members have never been what? Now, I want to ask you a question. How could I be in the church and never be converted? You mean to tell me it's possible to be a baptized member of the Seventh Adventist Church officially, but never have been converted? Is that possible? I can't hear you. Yes. yes. Now, my brothers and sisters, then that means then that the answer to bringing for God to start bringing people into the church is that we as church members, number one, must become what? Converted. But there's a second reason, which is likened to the first. It says those, and this is another reason, and those who were what? Talk to me, somebody. Once converted, but who have what? That's the only two reasons why God won't do it right now. Now, I want to ask you a question. What does it mean, once converted? But then it says, but have back what? Backslidden. What does it mean to backslide? Slide back. Go backwards. Now, I want to ask you a question. Is it once converted, always converted? No. Once saved, always saved? No. Do you mean to tell me that it is possible to have once been converted and then to lose that conversion? And do you know that many church members speak of a time when they were converted years ago, but not converted today? Do you know that our conversion must be daily? Our conversion must be weekly. Our conversion must be yearly 
or God can't work as much as he wants to bring souls into the church. And so my brothers and sisters, but do you know that in each case, what is the issue? Conversion. Conversion. So the only reason why God cannot now bring so many into the church is because of conversion. Now, what does conversion mean? What does conversion mean? Change. Give me another name for change. Reformation. There's been no change in us. And if there has been a change, we've gone back. Can you imagine someone embracing heart reform and then going back and giving their heart back to Satan? Can you imagine somebody embracing health reform and changing diet and health and life and then all of a sudden going back and beginning to pick up one thing that they put down? Or in dress or in music or in worship. Now, my brothers and sisters, can you imagine the man who stops smoking and then goes back and picks up that cigarette and starts puffing some more? What influence would that have? It said, what influence would these what? Unconsecrated members have on so if somebody were to be brought into the church with a lack of conversion what would we do to those brought in talk to me somebody we would cause their conversion to be hindered or perverted why because we would influence them with our unconversion does it make sense it says would they not not make of no effect the God given what message which his people are to bear then why would God bring them in to hear a message and we're not living out that message would it not nullify everything that we're teaching everything that we're preaching and so my brothers and sisters it's a waste of time for God to bring all the city into this church unless we will begin to practice what we preach and God says I want us to start with us right here in this little church and I praise God he's going to do it. What do you say? Amen. Now, we found out that there are two great things that needs to happen inside church members. In order for us to be an evangelistic, soul winning church, two great things that need to happen. I spoke of one last week. We want to speak of two uh, this week. Now, number one, does anybody remember what has to happen inside the church for a church members to begin to get strength? You know, it takes power to change. You ever seen a convertible, a car convertible? Do you know how it converts the, the automatic? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about one of these, you know, little made up ones where you kind of push, the, you know, you kind of make it do it yourself. But in, in, the, in these real uh, luxury cars, nobody gets out and starts converting the car over. Not an electric car. Those luxury cars, you know how the conversion takes place? A button is pushed. And there is power that begins to start moving to change and convert that car. Now, what would happen if the battery died on that car and you pushed the button? What would happen? It would not convert. It would not change. Now, do you know, brothers and sisters, it takes power to be converted. And do you know that as human beings, we don't have that power? Do you know that we cannot convert ourselves? We cannot convert our children. We cannot change ourselves. We cannot change of ourselves, our children. That power is of God. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is the power that God wants to bring to us. And that when souls come to the church, we can say there is power in the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And that we won't just lip it. We will say, I've tasted it and it has changed my life. I know that it can help you. Amen. Let me see someone who's ever smoked before. And you're not proud of it, but you've ever smoked before. Let me just see the hand of someone who has ever smoked before. You're not proud of it, but you smoked before. Now, let me see the hand of someone who smoked but has given up smoking. Amen. Praise the Lord. Does God have power to break addiction? Yes. Now, I can say the same for alcohol. I can say the same for every sin in the long, dark catalog. But my brothers and sisters, there is power for God to change us. Amen. But do you know that the church member is supposed to taste this power of Jesus so that when he meets somebody, he can speak of that power? Amen. Are you following? When he talks to his child, he can speak of it to his child of the reality of Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you know that God is getting ready to do this? But in order to have that power, something must happen to the church. What must happen to give this type of power to the church? Does anybody remember what we looked at last week? Number one. Does anybody remember what we looked at last week? And so someone says study. That's true, but not from what we studied. But, <laughs> but that's it. Uh, yes. We must be rooted. We must be what? We must be rooted. Now, plants. Do plants have power? Yes. Where do plants get their power? Where do they get their power? The soil. They get it from the sun. 
The power gets uh, of the plant comes from the sun. They call it a uh, 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 photosynthesis. And that's what converts power inside of a plant. He uses solar panels. You know, the, uh, uh, you know that a plant has solar panels. That's where we get the idea. When you call it a PV array, that is photovolic. It's that same PV, same thing in the plant. It's the exact same thing. And it takes the power of the sun, converts it into energy. And as a result, it has power. Now, my brothers and sisters, the plant has power. But tell me something. If a plant is not rooted, what can it do with the power of the sun? Nothing. What can the church do with the power of God if the members of the church are not rooted inside that church? What can they do? Nothing. Now, where in the Bible do we get the idea that God wants us to be planted? Where in the Bible do we get that idea? Isaiah chapter 27. Let's go there quickly. Isaiah 27. We saw that in Isaiah 60, God wants us to arise and shine. We see in Isaiah chapter 27 that God is wanting to watch us moment by moment. He wants to water us just like a plant. Look what the Bible says in Isaiah 27, beginning in verse 3. You're there, amen? amen? Let's read verse 3 together. The Bible says, the Lord do, what's the next word? Keep it. Now, speaking of God's people, his church. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. What does that sound like? When is the first time we heard the word or the expression, keep it? In the Garden of Eden. Who was, who was God talking to? Adam. God said to Adam to do what? To do what? Dress the garden and to keep it. So God is likening his people to a garden. Then the Bible says, I will, what's the next word? Water it. What do you do to plants in order for them to grow? Not just keep it, but what? Water those plants. Now jump down to verse 5. Or let him take hold of my strength and he may make peace with me and he shall make peace with me. And then verse 7, talking about that strength. How are we going to get that strength? Verse 6, let's read that together. What does verse 6 say? He shall cause them that come of Jacob to what? To do what? Take root. Take root. Now, number one, then we must learn as God's people, Israel, we must learn to take what? Root. Then the Bible says in taking root, it says what's going to be the result of taking root? Israel shall what? So what will happen in our lives and the lives of our family if we take root in God's church? We shall what? Blossom. You know that many of us are not blossoming as Christians, maturing as Christians, because we do not take root in God's church. And the Bible says we must take root. Not only shall we blossom, but what will be the result? We shall also what? Bud. And then what? Fill the face of the world with what? Now, what is a fruit? That's a soul that has been won to Christ. That God says that he wants to produce fruits. Do you know that when he comes a second time, Christ is coming for a harvest a harvest of fruit that have been prepared, the production of humanity into the image of God. Now, the Bible says that the only way that the earth is going to be full of this fruit is if somebody in the church does what? Talk to me, somebody. Take root. Now, I want to ask you a question. I asked it last week. I'm repeating for a reason. What would happen if you take a plant and you plant it and it begins to do what? It begins to do what? Take root and it begins to start flourishing. And then what would happen, Brother Bill, if I took that same plant, uprooted it, and now I'm going to another place and try to plant it down again this week? Well, you may say, well, it doesn't look so bad. It's going good. Then I take next week, take that plant and then uproot it and put it back in another soil. Now I take that plant the next week and put it back in another soil. And I keep doing this month after month. Eventually, that plant will get sickly and die. As in the natural, so in the spiritual. Talk to me, brothers and sisters. What happens to a church where the members of the church never take root inside of the garden? What happens? It gets sick and dies. Do you know this is the reason why Satan does not want us to come to church continually at a local congregation? And every week he will make up an excuse of why you can't be here. Every week he will come up with good reasons, good excuses. And I don't care how good the excuse is. If it stops us from taking root, it's of the devil. Let me say it again. It's of the devil. If it does not allow us to take root. Now listen, what I'm saying is, and if those who are watching the internet, I'm not saying you have to come down to Richmond. That, that's not what I'm telling you. There's no halo around this church above every other church. That's not what I'm telling you. There's no halo around a man. That's not what I'm telling you. What I'm telling you is that if we are understanding God and his plan, there is a local church for us. We must find that church 
and we and our families take root in that church. If it's somewhere else, then go somewhere else. And not in a bad way. But if it's here, then it has to be here. Now, can people visit churches? Can you do that? Yes or no? But you know that the life of a member of a church is not to visit? Do you know that we can never make the church what God designs it to be if every church member is all he's doing is visiting? We don't understand what the church is for. And God is trying to awaken us to understand the significance of what church is for. Church is not for visitation. Church is to become like a member of the body. I gave you the illustration last time. The member of the body is like what we use in the body. Can you imagine now if your hand starts visiting every week another place? <laughs> you say, well, something wrong with that. This week your foot wants to visit the church in Alaska. And next week he wants to visit the church in, 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 in Alabama. Well, something's wrong with that. You would have to look down at your foot or your hand or your body and say, you're going to have to get, uh, get it together. You know? <laughs> Am I right or wrong? Yes. Then what does it look like for God's body to have the members of his body all over the place instead of being rooted and grounded? Now, is there a time for the whole body to start visiting somewhere else sometimes? Is there a time for that? Yes. But you'll find out that this is not the plan of God week by week, day by day. Do you know what would happen to a community if the church was constantly just doing visitations? And do you know that there are responsibilities that are supposed to be had in a church? Now, see, we're getting ready. As God grows the church, the order of the church must develop with the growth of the church. And we're going to start talking about specifically the order that must be in, in, instituted in this church in order to sustain the growth of souls that God is getting ready to bring into the church. Every church that God sets up was organized, not into formalism. You see, we have confused preliminaries with order. That's not the same thing. We're going to find that if what you do at church is not in the Bible, it's not a part of God's church. Now, it, I will be hard pressed. You know, when you look at the order of a service, you know, you'll be hard pressed sometimes to find the order of that service in the Bible itself. Now, could that be the order of a Bible believing church if it's not even in the Bible? And so what we're going to do, we're going to show you the order of service from the Bible itself. And show what is supposed to be in the church and what's supposed to be a part of its service. And then whatever is not in the Bible, we get rid of it. And whatever is in the Bible, we keep it. We retain it. We know it's a part of the remnant. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because God is a God not of confusion, but of order. Now, do you know the Bible says, order thy steps in a church manual. Order thy steps in what other churches have been doing for years. That's tradition. The Bible says, order thy steps in thy word. So the order of the service in the church must be found in the word of God. Does that make sense? Yes. That's what the purpose of BTI is. To show us how to live every function of our life in accordance with the word of God that we may be in harmony with Jesus and become his friend. Do you want to be the friend of God? Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is why that God's church must take root. And look at 2 Samuel chapter 7. What book did I say? 2 Samuel 7. Now, my brothers and sisters, the plan I tell you now that in this church, we're getting ready to organize and God's getting ready to put together a team that's going to win this community. He's putting together a team that's going to win this state. Amen. He's putting together a team that's going to win this nation. And he's putting together a team that's going to win this world. And in this local chapter, Right here in Richlands, God is putting together a team. But guess what? Everybody's not going to make the cut. Now, everybody can make the cut, but everybody's not going to make the cut. Have you, ever, have you ever heard in sports of something called a cut? When God puts together a team, there's a cut. There's a shaking. There's a ceiling. And everybody's not going to make the cut. Now, in a local church, members, as we have here, our members are necessary for different places and different positions in order to do what needs to be done. And we're going to talk about some of these things, not today, but in the future. And we're going to see that. But do you know that we will not have a position if we cannot be faithful to the performance of duty? Because God will be looking for us and we'll be somewhere else. And the soul that was needed in order to be saved and to blossom and to bear fruit would have died. And so, my brothers and sisters, we can only have persons in positions that will be faithful week by week by week 
by week so we can be dependent upon. Now, does that mean nobody can visit the church? Is that, is that what that means? No, God is always open for visitors. But in order to finish the work, we don't need visitors. In order to finish the work, a church needs members. I remember we were doing meetings and a church was getting ready to be planted in another state. And they brought us in to help with the evangelistic work. And they said to me uh, in the follow up program, what should we do in order to really establish this church? And we were talking to them. And I said, one of the first things that you need to stop doing is constantly bringing in speakers. And they said, well, we brought you in. I said, that's right. <laughs> I said, it's not just it's not just for any other speaker and, and, and excluding me. I'm saying to you that as long as you keep doing this, the church will never grow. What the church will have is a group of visitors every month. But that won't win souls. And so someone says they'll bring in some major person and all of a sudden hundreds flock to that church for that week. And then you come to prayer meeting and they're not there. You come the next Sabbath and they are not there. Now, is that the manpower who's going to reach that community? Impossible. It's a false view. And so when the first thing I said is, yes, bring a, a minister or a speaker or a teacher that's moved by God in order to awaken interest. But then there needs to be consistent education and development to raise up teachers and members of a church so that someone can come and say, you know what? God is calling me here. Can you imagine hundreds coming and then looking at the church and saying, this is the place for me to grow my family. This is the place for me to begin to reach the community. God brought me here. Do you understand what I'm telling you? This is what must happen in this little church. And so my brothers and sisters, but whenever that doesn't happen, I told somebody, I said, look, you won't be as long as you're bringing these people, in, it's going to seem like a, a, an excitement. But guess what's going to happen when all that dies away? The church has gotten no stronger. And your life has actually become no different. You you are gaining energy from not getting sustenance and taking root. You're having what is called an excited energy. How many have ever drunk coffee before? Now, why do most people drink coffee? Anybody know why most people drink coffee? It's not because it tastes good. <laughs> Why do most people stay drink coffee? They, stay, they, they, they take or drink coffee to stay awake and to get some type of energy. But now think about it for a moment. Here's a man. He hadn't slept for two days. He's, he's been working night shifts and day shifts, and he's sleeping. He takes coffee to stay awake. And I want to ask you a question. Did that coffee give him rest? So then did that coffee really give him energy? What it did was create nervous excitement that robbed him of future energy. And you say, what do I mean? Now, here's a man right now, and he's saying, oh, he's sleeping. He can't do anything. You take a hammer and whack, hit him on the hand. Well, that man will wake up. Am I right or wrong? You doubt me? <laughs> Go to sleep and put your hand out. <laughs> and if I hit that thing with a hammer, you'll wake up and you'll wake up fast. Even if you only slept for two minutes. But that hit did not give you rest. It did not give you energy. It excited the nerves, but robs you of real energy. And now you, once you calm back down, you will get tired, more tired than you were before. Now, my brothers and sisters, I want us to understand that if all we're doing is going from place to place, church to church, speaker to speaker, YouTube to YouTube, camp meeting to camp meeting, thing to thing, all we're doing is trying to live from nervous excitement by drinking coffee, but not taking root the way to get power is to take root there's a vine and a branch there's a root of Jesse I want to tie into that root what do you say Amen. now my brothers and sisters second Samuel are you there second Samuel now I wasn't planning on saying all this but I'm just going I'm going to go where the Holy Spirit leads me let's go to second Samuel 7 look at what the Bible says in verse 10 let's read that together second Samuel 7 verse 10 are you there amen Verse 10, let's read it together. The Bible says, moreover, I will what? Appoint a place for my people Israel. What does appoint mean? You mean God has a place, a special place designed for me? You know, God has a special church for every member of his, of his flock. Not just a world church, but a local church. He has a special place. And the question is, do you know where that place is? I'm be honest with you. Half of your problem is solved if you know where that local place is. I praise God. I know where that local place is for me and my family. Now, I can't speak for everybody's family, but for me and my family. And that means that once I know that, then as a leader of my home, 
I must help my family to take root. And no matter what other family does, I cannot control every other family. Somebody can say to me, family, we're all going here. Well, that's you and your family, and that's between you and God. But as for me and my house, I've got to take root. Do you know that a man that does not lead his family in this way is being derelict to duty? It means he's not being faithful to the duty that God put upon him. Now, again, it doesn't have to be this church. It can be a thousand churches. But you have to take root in some place. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, the Bible says in verse 10, Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will, what's the next word? Plant them. Now, notice how God plants will plant them that they may dwell in, not places, but will dwell what? In a place. Where? Now, when we have something of our own, what do we call that? A home. So what do we call a church that is our own? Talk to me, somebody. A home church. Not a home church where you stay at home. (laughs) But a church that you call your home. Do you understand what I'm telling you? It's your own. And then the Bible says... And once he plants you there, what's going to happen? And what's the next three words? And what? I didn't hear you. And what, I didn't say what I said. What did the Bible say? And what? Move. So if we're really going to be planted and take root, then what lets us know that we've taken root? When we move what? That's how we know when we're taking root. But if we kind of find ourselves, we get the week moving and moving and moving and moving. We haven't taken root anywhere yet. And so, my brothers and sisters, one of the reasons why we are lacking what we should is because we can't do this. You know, you can never build up a church if all the members are constantly not having no root within themselves. But God is going to do it here. And you know, it only only has to be one, two, three. God can do it. It's not numbers. God is not interested in numbers. We're not interested in numbers here. What we're interested in is a, a faithful few that are willing to say, Lord, I see your plan. I must take root. First, Lord, show me where you want me to be. If it's rich lands, I'm going to take root here. As for me and my house, we're going to start coming and make up our mind every week unless there's an emergency. Every week unless we're visiting. Every week unless, and it's me, oh, I'm, you know, when you're in your house, you don't visit every day of your house. <laughs> or it wouldn't be your house. Now, some people may, <laughs> but it's an indication of something we don't like about the house. Now, it says in Education 268, another obligation too often lightly regarded, one that to the youth awakened to the claims of Christ needs to be made what? Now, why am I talking about this again? Because it has to be made what? Plain. It says, is the not choice, but the what? Obligation of what? Church relationship. Education 268. Very close and sacred is the relationship between Christ and his church. He the bridegroom and the church the bride. He the head and the church the body. Connection with who? Christ then involves what? Connection with his what? What if someone says, I want to be connected with Christ, but I'm, I'm not really trying to be connected with his church. Is that possible? No. Impossible. Christ is the head, church is the body. It goes on, 206, 268, education. The church is organized for service. So there's some service we're supposed to be doing. But if we're not connected, we can't do that service. It says, and in the life of service to Christ, connection with, talk to me, the church is one of the... So when I wake up and come to Christ and accept him and his message, one of the first thing I should do is, Lord, connect me to a church. To the church that you have for me and my family. One of the first steps. Loyalty to Christ demands, demands what? The faithful performance of. Now, what if I'm not a member of the church? Can I faithfully perform my church duty? I can't. How can I perform a duty? I'm not even part of the congregation. I'm not a part of that local membership. I cannot faithfully, day by day, week by week, perform my job. And the greatest job we can do right now is arise and shine and win souls for Jesus. What do you say? Amen. And my brothers and sisters, we don't have long. We'll come back to this when we get into harder study, but we don't have long. Who is this right here? Who is this man? Who is this man? The president of the United States. Your president. <laughs> now, I want to ask you a question. Where is he going in just a few days? He is going to Michigan. Is that right? Now look at what it says now. I want you to understand something. He's going somewhere. It says, President Byron received a public invitation from the United Auto Workers on Friday. Invitation. 
Why would the UAW invite Biden, the president? What are they doing right now? Well, they're striking. Very interesting. It says to join the picket lines and the unions and the unions. Who's doing the strike? Talk to me. Union strike against the national leading automakers. Now, the three major automakers, the has and in, there, in each of the corporations or companies, strikes have been started. Now, we look at that and we say, oh, well, that's not too bad. But I'm going to tell you something. This means something. It means something. Biden will join auto workers on picket line in what? In Michigan, a historic move. Now, prophecy, once it takes place, becomes history. All history is is fulfilled prophecy. So for this to be historic, somehow prophecy is being fulfilled. Now, I want to ask you a question. Why did they say historic? (coughs) What's never been done? Yes. The president of the United States going down in a strike and taking up the picket sign. (coughs) This is not ordinary. This is historic. But it means something. Something's happening. Let's see. President Biden announced that he would travel to Michigan on Tuesday to join the picket line with members of the United States automobile workers who are on strike against the nation's leading automakers is one of the most significant displays of presidential support for the striking workers in decades. Says Tuesday, I'll go to Michigan to join the picket line. Let me go jump down. Now the trip is set to come what? A day before Mr. Biden leading rival in the 2024 campaign, Donald Trump has planned his own speech in Michigan. Now, do you know that Biden's trip, he was actually supposed to go to the West Coast. That was already announced. But then all of a sudden, he says, well, I'm going to Michigan. I wonder why. <laughs> Someone says, oh, he's just interested in the, uh, uh, into the strike. Well, what happened the week before? Now, my brother and sister, you better understand something. It says he planned his own speech in Michigan and was announced and was announced hours after the union's president escalated pressure on the White House with a public invitation to what? Mr. Biden. Now you better watch this. Now, do you know that this auto strike is not happening by itself? See, we don't understand something. Look at this now. Strikes make a what? Comeback in what? In America, September 16, 2023. That was a long time ago, wasn't it? Now, my brothers and sisters, last week it said all of a sudden America as a nation are seeing strikes come back. There's a reason for this. Look what it says. The United Auto Workers strike isn't happening in a what? Does that mean that somebody's going around with a vacuum and, 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 and as they're cleaning the house? And What do you mean not in a vacuum? It's not an isolated, it's not an isolated event. It says the auto strike isn't happening in a vacuum. It's part of a what? Growing movement of U.S. workers walking off of the from Hollywood writers to nurses, factory workers, Starbucks. Thousands of workers have gone on strike in recent months to demand higher pay and improved benefits and working conditions. Do you know that the Bible told us this would happen? Spirit prophecy told us this. The Teamsters Union recently used the threat of a strike by 340,000 members of UPS to secure most of their demands. Labor has become more aggressive because of decades of what? <coughs> Stagnant wages for lower and middle income, income workers. While the richest Americans have expanded their wealth to unprecedented levels. Now, you understand what they're saying is creating the strike? That the working class, talk to me, what's happening with the working class? What do they see? They see a divide between the wealthy and the laboring class. And they're saying, wait a minute, while the top 1% are getting wealthy, the bottom are getting nothing. The bottom are getting what? Now turn around, my sister. Turn around. Come on. Look at the teacher. Look at the teacher. Very good. Look at the teacher. Good. Now it says labor has become more aggressive. Now look what it says. Corporate profit profits have soared since the pandemic. What are you talking about? 2020, right? And workers would want a greater piece of the. Now, I heard a CEO talking about the condition of the society. And know what he said? He said it with his own lips, talking to other uh, worker, uh, uh, CEOs and others like that. He said that the workers right now have gotten the big head. I'm paraphrasing. He said they've gotten the big head. That since the pandemic, 
They are being paid to do nothing. And it says now they want the employer to treat them as if they're gods. And he said, but you must remember that you are the employee and we are the ones who employ you. And he said, the only way that we can get you back to your senses is by letting you not have a job. Is by taking away the, the money from your pot paycheck so that you know who's the boss. This is what he said. Now, you know what a, 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 the man in the working class would have, to, <coughs> would have to do if he recognized that. This happened in France. And you know what it produced? A revolution. This is going to happen in America. You know what it's going to produce? A revolution. Now, my brothers and sisters, what happened in France started off as a civil war turned into a revolution. There is a generational change taking place in the labor movement and it's what? Talk to me. Thinking. A labor historian said between 1979 and 2022, the inflation adjusted annual wages of the top one percent of workers rose by what? In other words, the wealthies, their profit went over 145 percent in wealth. While the average annual wage of the bottom 90 percent rose only by 16 percent. So in other words, in 1979, the man that was making what he was making in 1979, his paycheck has changed a little by over 10 percent of what he was making today. But the wealthy over 100 percent. It says. According to Economic Policy Institute, several factors contribute to this. It says the auto workers, for example, are taking aim at CEO uh, uh, composition at four. And you know how much paycheck did the you know how much paycheck raise that the automobile workers want? Forty percent increase. Not 10 percent. They want 40 percent increase. That had never happened before. I mean, can you imagine you get a raise? You know, you know, you know, you know, I'm going to get a dollar, you know, two dollar, ten dollar, you know, a hundred. But 40 percent. But but no, it's not a lot. Now, and, I, and I said respectfully, but I want you to understand something. The reason why it looks like a lot is because we've been robbed. See, now, you understand, if, if I take a man's money, if I t let's say the man's making $1,000 a month, that's not a lot of money, right? $1,000 a month, not a lot of money. But if I make $1,000 a month and I have 12 months in a year, how much, months, how much money is that a year? Now, what if I take 100 years? Now, what do I have? I got a lot of money. So now, my brother says, if I say I want all of that money now that you were supposed to pay to me 100 years ago, you say, oh, that's too much. But it's only because you weren't given to me little by little that should have been given. But all of it is, des is, is deserving to me. Are you understand what I'm telling you? Now, my brothers and sisters, from 1979, there's been a little paycheck rise in the working class. And the wealthy corporation has just passed it on from the corporation down to corporation. And they've embraced the expansion, but not the working class. And the working class have studied this. In fact, watch what it says. Several, it says, uh, uh, which has grown by more, than, by, by more than what? Now, do you understand that the growth that they're asking for in the paycheck is comparative to the growth of the company? It's not a, a, a large thing. I mean, uh, is the CEO making the car? Is the CEO painting the car? Is the CEO doing the work? Who's doing the work? So then the employer has to recognize if he had no employee, he has no business. And if he has no business, he has no business talking to us the way he's talking. <laughs> now, do you understand what I'm telling you? And so, my brothers and sisters, God is trying to, to help us to see something. Now, in the world without God, look at this as a point of revolution. And without God, rightly so. But my brothers and sisters, God is trying to help us to see this means something. Country Living, page 12. Those who claim to be the children of God are in no case to bind up with the... Labor unions that are formed or that what? The children of God, no labor unions. Why? It says, this the Lord what? Now, do you know that most people have never learned that we were not to be a part of labor unions? Now, our study today is not why. Now, there's a biblical reason of why. We don't have time to look at that study right now. It says, this the Lord forbid. It's cannot those who what? Study the prophecies see and understand what is what now this is linking the rise of what and prophetic events being fulfilled right before us so when we see the rise of labor unions in america we should recognize something is happening in prophecy 
The trade unions and confederacies of the world are a what? Snare. What is snare? Trap. Keep out of them and away from them. The crisis is coming what? Because of labor unions, we're getting ready to see something happen in America. It says because of these unions and confederacies, it will, be very, it will soon be very difficult for our institutions to carry on their work where? Country living 10 and 11. Now, let me go on. I'll come back. The time is fast coming when the controlling power of the labor unions will be what? Very oppressive. Oppressive. For in the future, the problem of what? Buying and selling will be a very... You mean to tell me that the labor unions are going to have a part in bringing in America and the world to a place where we cannot buy or sell? You better watch this. This is a prophecy. This is prophecy. Now, my brothers and sisters, do we see the rise of unions right now? Now, why is it happening? What year are we in? What year are we in? Now, why is it happening in 2023? You better watch it. See, the devil has to create a problem and make the sorrow so bad that it feels like no human bomb can cure. Do you know that Project 2025 would never work if everything's going good? Project 2025 can only work if the world recognizes there's a problem in the government of America right now that needs to be changed. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Now, my brothers and sisters, this is what this tells us about Project 2025. Building now for a conservative victory through policy, personnel, and training. You know, they're setting up a school to educate every person to understand Project 2025 because they say you're not going to have a part in this government unless you be trained on it. And you know that they're giving the school for free. The actions of liberal politicians in Washington have created a what? Now, I want you to understand. Now, what if there's no desperate need? Then it would look like the idea that they're presenting is a, uh, is, a, is a false, is a fake, is a farce. You understand what I'm telling you? So then it must be seen that there's a problem in America in order for this governmental change in the image of the beast to be set up to, uh, to find place. It says the action of liberal politicians have created a desperate need and unique opportunity for conservatives to start undoing the... So then what has to be seen in America? Damage. Social damage, economic damage, political damage. We've got to see damage that left has wrought and built a better country for all Americans in what? It says this is the goal of the 2025 uh, 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 presidential transition. Look what it says now. It is not enough for conservatives to win elections. If we're going to rescue the country from the grip of the radical left, we need both a governing agenda and the right people in place ready to carry this agenda out on day One. of the next conservative administration i'm talking about 2025 plus or minus and do you know what they said they said that one of the things that must be put back in place is a sunday law in the agenda do you know that every one of us should wake up and say i see that prophecy is being fulfilled but my brothers and sisters, you know what we should be doing right now? We should be saying, Lord, help me to rise and shine. Help me to do what? Take root so that I can flourish. That I can grow not only myself, but that I can cause fruit in the world itself. What do you say? Let's stop. Let's pray. Father, we've come to the heart of our study this morning. And as we get ready to look at some transitional points before we get ready to move into this last part of our study for today, we ask, Lord, that you would help us to make a decision today that things have to be different. That we cannot remain the same, that there has to be a change in our individual lives and in our family. And Lord, we have no power without Jesus. The handwriting is on the wall. And Father, we need your help today. We need your help this Sabbath. We need your help right now to help us to, to stop planning for ourselves and to leave our own agenda and to look for the plan that you've given us in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy and to set our house in order by ordering our steps in, our, in your word and not our own ideas. It is you that told us to take root. It is you that told us to plant, to be planted. It is you that told us that we're to come to a place and not move. It is you that told us that we are to learn how to develop and grow. And Father, we want to learn today and, and, and week by week as fast as we can, for time is running out. Abide with us now, Father, remove me. I'm fickle, feeble, and frail, but you can speak to us and help us to get into position before it is too late. 
So bless us now, we pray, as we spend these few moments together. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you'll take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. We're turning to 1 Peter chapter 4, and we want to just take a few moments to look at something from the Word of God before we go into a particular presentation that one of the classes or, or one of the teams are going to present to us. But let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4, and when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. amen. 1 Peter chapter 4. Now, this Sabbath of a BTI... We have to, I cannot overemphasize the fact that what we're living in today is not ordinary. This is not ordinary. What we're seeing in the union, not ordinary. The president going, not, not ordinary. What we're seeing economic, politically, not ordinary. In fact, you know, I told you uh, socially that things that we see are not ordinary. In fact, I, I remember reading just, I believe it was last week, a woman that says she wanted to be with her, uh, her husband. And her husband said, I'm getting divorced. Now, ordinarily, if a man gets a divorce, especially in the world, not a Christian, but in the world, they say, well, we don't want to get a divorce. We separate and that's it. But this woman said, I, I, I'm flying down to where you are. They were in different places. She went down to where the man was that she used to be a, a husband to, or at least they used to be together. She gets to the house and she begins to say, we need to stay married. He says, no, I, I, I'm certain. Look at you. We, we can't. Look at how you, our relationship. We can't stay like this. The woman, all of a sudden, when he, she saw that he was not going to uh, uh, marry her or stay married to her, she takes out a gun. Now, I want to ask you a question. If you're trying to stop a divorce, why would you bring a gun? That's not ordinary thinking. That would be one thing if you had a card, you know, a, a, a card saying, please, <coughs> please forgive me. But a gun, that's not ordinary. She takes out the gun. When the man uh, 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 protests, she shoots the man in the bed. Now, praise God, the man didn't die. The man was able to get up, knock the woman down, run to safety. But that's not ordinary. And it's not just the adults. Our children, 14-year-old, stabs a 13-year-old to death. Stabbed her over 100 times. That's not ordinary. It's extraordinary. That's not natural. It's supernatural. And God is showing us that his spirit is being withdrawn from the earth. And God is trying to show us that the end of all things is at hand. This is a savage time. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. You're there, amen? Let's read verse 7. 1 Peter 4 verse 7. What does the Bible say? It says, but the end of all things is. Now, I want to tell you something. The end of all things should not simply produce into us intellectual information. That's not all. If all we do is see anything, all things at hand, yes, the end, of the, the end of the world is near. That's not enough. It is to produce practical change. What do you mean? Look what the Bible says. Then of all things at hand, be ye therefore. In other words, because of this, be ye therefore, talk to me somebody, what? Sober and watch unto pray. In other words, pray like we never prayed before because then all things at hand. Study like we never studied before. Why? Then of all things at hand. But then it says, watch and be sober. What does it mean to be sober? Don't be drunk. Confused. You know, when a man is drunk, it used to be that a man, when he got drunk, he took Heineken or Hennessy or Budweiser. But now the Bible is telling us that you can be drunk not just with alcohol. You know, we can be drunk with the cares of this life. We can be drunk right now where we have too much of something that gives us no time for Jesus Christ. You know, the man can be drunk with Netflix. A man can be drunk with TikTok. Man can be drunk with YouTube. You know, the generation today drunk with YouTube. You know, all the YouTube is not world. You know, you can take a, 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 you can get drunk on Christian YouTube. One after another, you're just binging. What, you, you don't even have to, you just take it off of, you press yourself, you put it on auto. It just go from one to another. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know that this type of drunk prevents us from really having personal time with God and time together as a family? It's a trick of Satan so that the child gets more acquainted with YouTube than with you and me. He knows the commercials. He knows the lingo and the words, the phrases, and the only thing he can talk about is what came on YouTube. That's as bad as television. It's just a television in another form in this generation. Are you understanding what I'm telling you? 
And that means all of us must look at it and say, Lord, if the end of all things at hand, I've got to do something different. God, you've got to help me so there's a change in my life. And do you know, brothers and sisters, the world doesn't, has no idea what all this means. And do you know that God intended for the church to be a light in the midst of the darkness of the world? God wanted us to be a light to the world. But in order to do that, something must happen to us. Go to Luke. What book did I say? We're going to Luke chapter 5. In order for us to be a light to the world, the same thing that happened in Christ must happen to us. Was Jesus the light of the world in his day, yes or no? The Bible says, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Now, my brothers and sisters, what was it that Jesus did to reach the masses of mankind and get their attention? There was something about Jesus, something that he did, something that he was. Tell me something. What was it about Jesus that allowed him to be a solution to the problems of the world? Talk to me. He was a what? He was a teacher. Let me put that on the board. He was a teacher. Now, somebody says, how can teaching solve the problems of the world? Well, I'm not talking about the teaching of this world. I'm talking about biblical teaching. Now, my brother says, uh, uh, what was it about Jesus? Uh, Luke, I didn't give you a verse yet. And so what we're saying is that God wanted us to be a teacher. Now, my brothers and sisters, we must understand there's something about the power of biblical teaching that can solve our problems. Our personal problems, our family problems, our world problem, our nation, national problem. Now, if there's damage to society, what we need is not a government. What we need is a school. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Is the government bad? No. But do you know that it has always been the plan that education was to help government? Do you know that even that's why they have public schools? Do you know that in the, the development of public schools came because the government of America and other governments recognize that there's a direct relationship between education and in government? And so the schools were provided free of charge to actually make a better citizen, to make a better government. That was the theory. Now, my brothers and sisters, you must understand that God's plan, all Satan is doing is counterfeiting it. If this was not so, Jesus would not have come this way. Jesus would have come as a politician, controlling government to solve the problems of the world. But he didn't do that. Jesus would have come as, a, 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 as an econ economist, but he didn't do that. Jesus came to us as a, what, talk to me, teacher. In fact, we're going to find out that Jesus came to us not only as a teacher, but Jesus came to us today. I'm going to give you another name. That doesn't start with T, but actually starts with D. He came not only as a teacher, he came as a, he came as a doctor. Very good. Now, I'm going to give us another name for doctor. Now, look what the Bible says in Luke chapter 5. Let's read verse uh, 17 together. Luke 5. Let's read verse 17 together. You're there, amen? amen? Let's read verse 17 together. The Bible says in verse 17, and it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching, teaching that there were Pharisees and what else? Doctors. Now, it's amazing. Jesus was what they professed. And they professed what they were not. It's possible to profess to be a doctor and not be a doctor. And it's possible to never call yourself a doctor and be a doctor. All you have to do is know what a doctor is. And if that man's doing it, he's a doctor. And that man's not doing it, though he calls himself a doctor, he's not a doctor. Are you following me? Yeah. Now, all we got to do is understand. So, now, my brothers and sisters, I'm going to give you another name for doctor. What is another name for doctor? Go back to Luke chapter 4. I'm not going to tell you. I want you to tell me. I'm going to test you this morning. Pop quiz. Luke 4. Now, I'm going to give you a hint. You want a hint or you want, you want to just get a name yourself? You want a hint? No hint. No hint. All right. Luke chapter 4. Someone say, oh, no, don't tell me that, Brother Garrison. You give us a hint. You know <laughs> Luke chapter 4, verse, we want another name for doctor. Luke chapter 4, we're going to read verse 23 together, and then you tell me that other name. In fact, now I want, I want someone to read for me. Uh, Sister Rochelle, would you read for me? Luke chapter 4, verse 23. Loud and clear. What does the Bible say in Luke 4 and verse 23, please? And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician... Heal thyself. I want to ask you a question. What's another name for doctor? Talk to me. Physician. What do you say, what do you say Micah? Physician. physician. Very good. And so another name for doctor is a physician. Now, question. Is that even true today? Yes. That's even true today. Am I right? right. That a doctor is called a physician. Now, so then, then, then my brothers and sisters, if we know what a physician is, guess what we also know? What a doctor is. Now, what does a physician do? What does the Bible say? 
Now, Jesus was announcing his ministry as a teacher, as the Messiah. And he said, it was going to be said of me as, a, as the Messiah, as the teacher, it's going to be said of me, physician, do what? Yeah. So then what is the work of a physician? Talk to me, somebody. Yeah. So then what is the work of a doctor, somebody? Yeah. So then my brothers and sisters, if I'm healing, what am I? A doctor. a doctor. And if I'm not healing, if I call myself a doctor, what am I not? A I'm not a doctor. I may be a bad doctor, but I'm not a true doctor. In fact, the Bible speaks in Job of physicians of no value. Physicians of no value. They don't do any healing, only hurting. Now, my brother and sister, I want to ask you a question. Is the body the only thing that needs to be healed? Tell me something else that needs to be healed. Can a government be healed? Does a government need healing? You know that in the government of the Church of Rome, the Bible says that the government received a deadly wound and his deadly wound was healed. So that tells us that a government or a church can receive disease and be healed. Now, my brothers and sisters, what else needs healing? Tell me some other things that need healing. Not just governments, a house, a home. So a family can need healing. What do we say sometimes? Uh oh, the family is broken, they're hurt, and they need what? Healing. What are some other things that can need healing? Not only government, not only family, what else? Talk to me. Relationships, marriage, relationships between parents and children, relationships between siblings. Do we need healing, yes or no? Uh, with God, yes. What about financially? Yes or no? Now, my brother and sister, I want to ask you a question. What if a man has his doctorate and finances, but he can't heal my financial problem? What is he not? He's not a doctor. What if a man has a doctorate in, in marriage counseling, but he can't heal my marriage? What is he not? He's not a doctor. And so my brothers and sisters, you're looking at, you're looking at the teacher. Look at the teacher. You're looking at the teacher. If there's going to be healing or doctors in any of these lines of fields or fields of work or life, then it shows us that healing or solution to problems must take place. Now, do you know that this is why Jesus drew so many people? Because they looked upon Jesus as a doctor. As a what? Look at Luke 5. Let me show you that. Luke 5. Look at what the Bible says in verse 17. Let's read verse 17 together. Luke chapter 5. And now, uh, I says together, I want someone else to read verse 17. Who will read verse 17? Who will read verse 17 for me? Luke chapter 5 and verse 17. Who will read that? All right, my brother. Would you read that for me loud and clear? Luke chapter 5 and verse 17. And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching. I, I like that power, brother. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Glory to God. That there were Pharisees and doctors. And what? And what? Doctors. Pharisees and doctors. All right, continue. Of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee. Now, I want and you to Judea. notice they're coming. All these people are coming. We want to find out why. Continue. And Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. So when Jesus was teaching, in his teaching, there was what? Talk to me, somebody. Healing power. No matter what the problem was, he could solve and heal their problem. Now, how do we know that this is what drew the masses to him? It wasn't what school he went to. It wasn't anything behind his name. But look at what the Bible says in verse 15. Same chapter. Verse 15. Let's read that. Would you pass that on, Brother Tim? Would you read that, Brother Tim? Verse 15. What does the Bible say in verse 15? But so much be more went very fame abroad of him and a great multitude. Now, when it says great multitudes, what does it mean? Large oh, amounts of people. Masses. Why? Continue. Great multitudes. Came together to hear and to be healed by him of her infirmity. So why did all these masses come to Jesus? It used two words that bring us to the same place. They came to what? Hear and be what? Healed. Now my brother, <coughs> brothers and sisters, when they heard, what was he doing? They heard his teaching. What was the result of his teaching? Healing. Now my brothers and sisters... This is the reason why so many follow Jesus that there was no building in Palestine that was large enough to house the crowd that came to where Jesus was. No building in Palestine that was large enough to house these crowds. And I want us to see that there's a reason. Go to Isaiah chapter 2. What book did I say? Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah 2. I want you to see this. Now look what it says. The gospel is a wonderful simplifier of life's problems. Its instructions heated will make plain many perplexity and save us from many an error. It teaches us. It does what? It teaches us uh, uh, what God is trying to uh, let us to understand. Now, I want to go a little further. I want to read something very interesting here. 
Ministry of Healing 17. It says, the Savior's work was not restricted where? To any time or place. Now read it with me. Read it with me. His compassion knew no limit. On so large a scale did he conduct his work of and that there was no building where in Palestine large enough to receive the multitudes that so what has to happen to the church in order for there to be no building that can house the people that are going to come to this church in Richlands? We've got to do the proper teaching because teaching is what actually produces, guess what? Healing. In fact, someone says, well, I thought a doctor healed. Well, you know what a doctor is? All a doctor is is a, the word doctor means teacher. And so my brothers and sisters, God is trying to bring us to a place where we can learn how to teach and live so that we can heal the problems that exist in society. Now, what would happen when a church becomes a church of doctors? Not by going and getting PhDs. Not by putting white coats on and stethoscopes around their neck. But when the church members begin to take up biblical teaching. Do you know that God wants every member of the church, when he takes root, to become a teacher? To become a what? Teacher. So every one of us is to become a teacher. That's what it means to be a follower of Christ. If Christ was a teacher and we're like Christ, then we must become teachers. Are you following what I'm telling you? Yes. And if we understood the power of this, and this is why the devil wants to stop this, do you know that you can never become a teacher by just becoming a tumbleweed all over the place? Mm. We've got to learn to take root, to understand. Now, in biblical teaching, there are three parts. What are the three parts of biblical teaching? You just get up and start teaching, and teaching the, the, the world what's going on. Is that what it does? What are the biblical parts, uh, uh, three parts of biblical teaching? Talk to me, somebody. Give me one. Give me one. To know. To know. Is that three? No. That's two? That's one. All right. To know. Give me the second part of biblical teaching. To do. Give me the third part of biblical teaching. Praise the Lord. Now, some people, when they start trying to teach to become healers, they want to jump to just teach. But my, I want to ask you a question. What if we don't practice what we preach? Are we really healing those around us, yes or no? no, no. We're creating a greater problem. Do you know that uh, a greater problem than if we just be quiet? Do you know that, 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 that if, 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 if today mankind only taught what he was doing, most teaching would stop? I'm going to repeat that. If mankind only taught what he was doing, most teaching would stop. Why? Why? Talk to me. Don't, don't, don't be afraid. Talk to me. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Because we're not doing it. You know, right now, a person can more easily drink, uh, 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 teach, drink water without drinking water. Now, what type of good teacher would that be? To be a, what type of an effective teacher it's not to tell somebody to drink water and you're not drinking water. Do you know right now today that a person can tell a person many things but are not practicing it where? Ourselves. But in biblical teaching, we first must know and then do and then. All right, I'm going to test you. Biblical preaching. Don't look at the board. Three parts of biblical teaching. Sister Haywood. Knowing, doing, and teaching. Praise the Lord. Three parts of biblical teaching. Micah. Knowing, doing, and teaching. Praise the Lord. Three parts of biblical teaching. Brother Tim. To know, to do, and to teach. Praise the Lord. Amen. Three parts of biblical teaching. Selah. Good. Amen. Three parts of biblical teaching. Gianna. You can say it. First here, what? Amen. Knowing. Amen. Second. It's all right. It's okay. It's okay. Second, what? You're actually what? Doing. Good. Amen. And the third part is what? Very good. 
That's my girl. Praise the Lord. All right. Three parts of biblical teaching, Olivia. Praise the Lord. Three parts, of Zara, of biblical teaching. Knowing, doing, teaching. Good! Even a baby can understand this. Let's say it together. What are the three parts? Knowing, doing, teaching. Now, later on, I'm going to test you on that. Not today. We got one little part to finish. Now, my brothers and sisters, so then God must make the church a, a church of teachers. And that means that first we've got to study and pray so that we can know what God's truth is. Mm -hmm. Then we've got to ask God for power to enter into a relationship with him where we can do what the teaching says. Amen. And then we're in a position to start sharing and teaching with others what God is teaching to us. Amen. And if that would happen, it would change us and those who hurt us. Amen. Now, now, my brothers and sisters, go to Isaiah 2. You, you should be there right now. Are you there? Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah 2, beginning in verse 1. There's a prophecy that tells us that the church of God in the last days will become a light. That the church of God in the last days will become like Christ. That they will come back to the place where they will be teaching like Christ and the result will be no building can house those who come to her. In Isaiah chapter 2, it says that the church will shine clear as the sun, fair as the moon, and terrible as an army of banners. Notice what it says in Isaiah chapter 2. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Let's read verse 2 all together. Isaiah 2 verse 2 it says, And it shall come to pass when? In the last day. Here's the last day prophecy. That the mountains of the Lord's house, that is his church, mm -hmm. shall be established in the top of the mountains. Mm -hmm. And he shall be exalted above the yeah. hills. And how many nations? All. all nations shall flow into it. Now here is a place where all nations are flowing into a question. What would happen to a building of all the nations flowing into it? There's no building in which uh, uh, could house the nation. It would be larger than any building that man could create. And then the Bible says, all nations shall flow into it. But notice why. Verse 3 says, and many people shall go and say, come ye and let us do what? No. Go up unto the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of... Jesus. Now, why are they coming to God's church or God's house? Because of the lights. No. Because of the paint. No. Because of the pews. No. What does the Bible say? It says, and he will teach us. <coughs> so why are they coming? Talk to me. Why did they follow Jesus? Teach. So now, my brothers and sisters, the same thing that attracted the world to Christ will attract the world to his last day church. And the Bible says what they're going to teach. They're going to teach his what? His ways. Now, what's, where do you think we'll find God's ways? Where do you think we'll find God's ways particularly? In the scripture, yes. In the sanctuary, yes. What's inside of that sanctuary or the scripture that is going to show us God's way? What is he talking about? What is going to be there that will show us? Go to Matthew 24. What book did I say? Matthew. Quickly, Matthew 24. Matthew 24. And look at what it says in Matthew 24th chapter. What is it that he's going to be teaching? What is the church of God going to be teaching? They're going to teach the same thing Christ taught. Matthew 24 tells us in verse 14. Matthew 24 and verse 14. What does the Bible say? It says, and this gospel of the king. What was Jesus teaching when he was on there? Talk to me. He said, the Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel. Same message. Same teaching. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached how much? In all the world for a witness unto where? All nations. And then shall the? So what is the church supposed to be teaching in the last days? Talk to me. Gospel. Now, question. The way we're going to find in this gospel, the church is going to teach this gospel. Now, what type of gospel is it? I heard somebody saying over here. Someone said, look at the text. Look at the text. The answer is right there in the text. In verse 14, it says, in verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the... Amen. So what type of gospel? Talk to me, somebody. Amen. It must be an end time gospel. Now, where or what book of the Bible is clearly identified as the end time biblical uh, 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 book of the Bible? 
Revelation. Now, in the book of Revelation, the Bible speaks of this end time gospel. In Revelation 14, notice what the Bible says in Revelation 14. This is what the church of God must be teaching. But remember now, if the church is going to be teaching this, what must it do before it be teaching this? Uh -uh. Uh -uh. You're right, but I'm in order. I want to go backwards. I want to go backwards. So before they're teaching it, what must they be doing? They're doing it. But before they're doing it, what are they supposed to be doing? They must know it. Before they can know it, of course, they must study to show themselves approved. So the Bible says in Revelation 14, Revelation chapter 14, beginning in verse 6, the Bible tells us something very interesting. It says in Revelation 14, verse 6, it says, and I saw what? What does it say in verse 6? Another angel, messenger, fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. So that end time gospel of Matthew 24 is identified in Revelation as the everlasting everlasting gospel. It says, the everlasting gospel, continuing on, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And then it goes on. Now, what are these messages called? Talk to me, somebody. So then what must the church be teaching in order for the multitudes to run into it? What must they be teaching? The end time gospel that is found in the three angels of Revelation 14. Does that make sense? Yes. Look what the prophet says concerning this. Look what the prophet says. Seven Adventists have been chosen not by man but by what? God, God as a peculiar people separate from the world by the great cleaver of So what separates us from the rest of the world? Talk to me somebody. This great what? Cleaver of truth. I wonder what this cleaver of truth is. Because that's what separates us from the world. This great cleaver of truth has cut them out from the core of the world and brought them into connection with what? Himself. He has made them his representatives and has called them to be his what? So seven Adventists are ambassadors to God, for God. It says for him in the last work of salvation, in time. Let's read this together. (coughs) It says, the greatest wealth of truth ever entrusted Now listen to that. To mortal beings. You almost sound like a superhero. You know what I'm saying? That he's stronger than mortal man. It says the greatest wealth of truth ever entrusted to mortals. The most solemn and fearful warnings ever sent by God to man have been committed to them. That is seven Adventists. To be given to what? So then my brothers and sisters. What has God given us? The greatest wealth of truth. Where is that greatest wealth of truth? In the great what? So what is this cleaver of truth? Look at what it says now. Volume 5, 455. That was volume 7, 138. God has called his church in this day as he called ancient Israel to stand as a light in earth. Remember, rise and shine. That light has come. By the mighty what? Now, wait a minute. Mighty cleaver of truth. Now, back here, it said that God has given us this great cleaver of truth, greatest wealth of truth ever given to mortals. We want to know what that cleaver of truth is. That mighty cleaver of truth is the messages of the first and second and third angels he has separated them from the so what messages separate us from all every other church in the world the three three angels messages so what message is to distinguish us from every other denomination so then what message would be a symbol of our denomination the three angels it says he has separated them from the churches now if I got rid of those messages if the messages separated me from the other churches If I got rid of those messages, what would they do to me? It would make me back in an ecumenical union with those churches. So it says that it separated me from the churches and from the world world to bring them into a sacred nearness to what? Now, do you know that most people think that what separated us is the Sabbath? But the Seventh-day Baptists have the Sabbath, right? But they don't have this. In fact, look what the prophet says. As far as the Sabbath is concerned, he occupies the same position as the Seventh-day Baptist. Separate the Sabbath from the... Now, what messages? What messages? It talks about this third angel. Talking about three angels. Separate the Sabbath from the messages and it loses its power. You know, the Sabbath has no power to the Jews. It's separated from the messages. The Sabbath has no power for the Seventh-day Baptist or the Pentecostal. Who knows about the seven day? No, the church. See, it's not the Sabbath by itself. 
The Sabbath gets power as it's connected with the three angels' messages. The everlasting gospel. What about health reform? No power unless it's what? Connected. What about dress reform? No power unless it's what? So then all of this truths. Look what it says now. The theme, of, the theme of greatest importance is the third angel's message, embracing the messages of the first and second angels. All should understand the truths contained in these messages and do what? Demonstrate them only on the Sabbath. Demonstrate them in what? Now I want to ask you a question. What do you think is one of the first lessons that the three angels' message would teach us so that we can then teach the world. What do you think is one of the first messages? Somebody say worship. Who said that? So worship. All right. Anybody else? First message. First lesson they would teach us. Family life. The message itself. All right. Go to Proverbs 9. What book did I say? Go to Proverbs 9. We'll see the first lesson. And we'll get ready to close. Proverbs chapter 9. Now, my brothers and sisters, I want to tell us. You're going to Proverbs 9. The Bible says the very first lesson of the three angels' messages, he starts his message thus. Fear God. What do you say? This is the first great lesson now that we must teach to the world. Before telling the world to give glory to God, before telling the world to worship him and show them that, that there must be an understanding of the fear of God, and we're going to find out that the real thing that's damaging our nation is that our nation has lost the fear of God. Our society has lost the fear of God. Our schools have lost the fear of God. Our families have lost the fear of God. And as a result, we're suffering. And the Bible says that the angel comes and says, fear God. And he continues. Now look at Proverbs chapter 9 in verse 10. Let's read Proverbs 9 verse 10 together. What does the Bible say in verse 10? It says, the fear of the Lord is the end, is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the, not talking about heels and hair, but holiness, is understanding. The knowledge of the holy is understanding. So the fear of the Lord is the one. Talk to me, somebody. Is the beginning. Christ is Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. So then one of the first lessons that we're to teach to the world is how to do what? Talk to me, somebody. How to do what? Fear God. Now, I want to ask you a question. If I'm going to biblically teach the world how to fear God, what must happen before I teach the world to fear God? I must do fearing God. I must practice fearing God. In order for me to practice fearing God, I must what? Talk to me, somebody. I must know what it is. I want to ask you a question. What is the fear of God? Now, someone says, I know what the fear is. You know, we have patent answers sometimes. You know what a patent answer is? Sometimes we respond, just throw it off, but not really think it through. And I want us in our class not to not be able to, to throw it out, but to actually throw it through and understand what do you mean when you say that the fear of the Lord is to hate evil? What do you mean when you say that? Someone says, well, it means hate evil. That's true. I want us to go a little further today and understand a little bit more specifically, uh, and we won't finish this study. I'm just introducing it. Fear God. I'm talking about being able to teach. To fear God, to become a teacher, I must say, Lord, I must do this, but before I can do it, I must know what it is. I must know what it is. What does it mean to fear God? Now, look what the Bible says. I want to see very clearly in the Bible what it means briefly. Look what the Bible says. Very carefully, in the book of Psalms 89. We're going to Psalms 89. Does it mean to be afraid of God? Fearful of him, and we're afraid. We say, oh no, God is there, I don't want to be there. Is that, how, is that what it means? No. In fact, go to, go to Hebrews chapter 12. Go to Hebrews 12. Go to Hebrews 12. Let's go to Hebrews 12. Go to Hebrews chapter 12. Look what the Bible says in Hebrews 12. New Testament, Hebrews 12. Look what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12. And notice what the Bible says in Hebrews 12, near the end of the chapter, God attaches something to understand what true fear is. In Hebrews 12, beginning in verse 28, let's read that together. Hebrews 12, 
and verse 28. Uh, I said together. Is any one of, is, let me see if one of our young people are there. Anybody in Hebrews 12, 28 yet? Any young person in Hebrews 12, 28? No young person there yet? Okay, I had to move on then. Any adult in Hebrews 12, 28? All right. All right so you, you got there already? You, okay, uh, Micah, Micah's there. Hebrews 12, 28. Where, where's our microphone? Thank you, my friend. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28. Would you read that for us loud and clear, my friend? What does it say, Micah? Uh, my, my missionary friend. Hebrews 12, verse 28. What does it say? Wherefore, we receive Very a good. kingdom. Very good. I like that power. Continue. Which cannot be moved. In other words, it's not planted all over the place. Continue. Let, uh, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably. How? With reverence and godly fear. Now, the Bible says there is a godly fear, so that means that there is a satanic fear. Yeah. A worldly fear. That's not what fear God is talking about. Fear God is talking about godly fear. Now, what is associated with godly fear? What is associated with it? Reverence. Now, my brothers and sisters, this becomes important because that means that one of the first things that we're to teach the world is what? Reverence for God. Now, do you know that it makes no sense to teach the world about the Sabbath without teaching them about reverence? Before you say worship him that made heaven and earth and sea, before you teach about this now, you will notice that there's a linkage between four things. Now, we see this reverence uh, as part of this fear from God. Look what the Bible says in Leviticus chapter 19. What book did I say? Amen. Let's go to Leviticus. Watch how interesting the Bible is. Leviticus 19. I love it when we don't have to make anything up. See, all seven day Adventism is is the religion of the Bible. It's a wonderful thing when everything you believe is in the word of God. It's wonderful, brothers and sisters. Amen. The Bible says in Leviticus chapter 19. Look at what the Bible says beginning in verse 30. Let's read that together. I want you to notice something very interesting. Leviticus chapter 19, the third book of the Bible, Leviticus 19 and verse 30. Are we there? Amen. Amen. Let's read that together. Leviticus 19 and verse 30. Let's read that. What does the Bible say? It says, you shall what? Keep my Sabbath and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Give me another name for reverence my sanctuary. You shall what? Fear my sanctuary. Reverence. Now we're going to find out that the first thing that we should reverence is God. If we're going to reverence God, then we must reverence everything that is His. Now what is His? What did He say that He has? Does God have a Sabbath? Yes or no? So then we're to reverence God and we're to reverence his what? Talk to me. Sabbath. His Sabbath. What else? Sanctuary. His sanctuary. What is a sanctuary? Give me another name for sanctuary. His house. His house. Give me another name for house. Church. His church. We're to reverence God's church. There used to be a sign over churches that would say when you walked in, especially in the islands, reverence my sanctuary. Now, my brothers and sisters, I want you to watch this now. Now, the fourth thing that God tells the reverence is, guess what? Inside the in, in the family, we're going to see that there's reverence in the family. And you'll see that the reverence is to go to father and guess what? Mother. Father and what? Mother. We're not, we don't have time to go through it now. Another time we're going to study. We're going to study reverence more carefully. But we're going to find out, brothers and sisters, that honor and reverence is talking about the same thing. Honor father and mother, reverence father and mother. Honor the Sabbath, reverence the Sabbath. Now, you want to find out that also husbands and wives, there's to be reverence inside of that relationship. Now, what happens... If I do not learn how to reverence God, it's going to stop me from reverencing his what? Sabbath. It's going to stop me from reverencing the church. It's going to stop me from bringing out reverence in the family, in the marriage, and in the family relationship. And as a result, the nation will be destroyed. Because the heart of the nation is the family. So now, my brothers and sisters, as we look at this, Satan wants to destroy what word? Talk to me, somebody. Reverence. reverence. Now, you're going to find out. This is why in the church, you will notice as a minister, I stop certain things from happening. Are you understand what I'm telling you? There's a reason for this. And it's part of something that must be done in the church before God is going to bring many people into the church. Every family has to learn how to establish reverence in their own heart and in their own home. Do you know that in the church, we have lost the reverence for God? Now, do you know, brothers and sisters, if I do not reverence the sanctuary, guess the next thing I'll stop reverencing? The Sabbath. The Sabbath. And guess the next thing I'll stop reverencing? 
So that when a man does not reverence the church, he's going to lose reverence for the Sabbath. And then he's going to lose hold of his relationship with God himself. Now, brothers and sisters, are there certain things that we would not do if we understood reverence for God? Are there certain things that we would not allow in our children if we knew reverence for God? Is there certain things that young people would do or not do if we knew reverence for God? Now, must a young person, are they going to come out of the womb? Oh, I know what reverence for God is. How is a young person supposed to learn reverence for God? There's to be teaching. Without teaching, no child can learn it. The Bible says, train up a child. Not tell the child, but what? Train. Train. Talking about teaching. Teach the child in the way he should go. And so if there's not reverence in children, it's not our children's fault. You know where the fault lies? The minister first. You say, what do you want me? Because the minister was supposed to teach this. Are you following? Then the fault lies first and foremost. I thought you said the first was minister. Yes, but then there's another first. (laughs) It lies upon parents. Because regardless of what a minister teaches, we have a Bible for our selves. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know that a child will never learn how to reverence the sanctuary on Sabbath if families don't practice Sunday and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday? How can we expect a child to sit in church and write notes if that doesn't happen all week long? If the first time they pick up a pen to take notes is during the worship service at church, it will seem foreign to them. But if in their family worship, they can learn how to take a Bible and take a pen and begin to write or scribble or draw before they can learn to write. And as they mature, to learn to physically write. This begins to develop, but, but, but that doesn't happen unless somebody recognizes. Do you know that right now, when an adult talks in church, that that's irreverent. Now, we're going to go through the Bible. We're going to study step by step. There's something the Bible calls behavior in the house of God. There is a way that we're supposed to behave ourselves in God's house. Now, look at what this says. I want to read this as we get ready to close. This says, Child Guidance 551, 541. What is this? And don't get quiet on me now. Don't get quiet on me now. It says, Child Guidance page what? 541. We have more reverence, re- reasons for reverence than the Hebrews. Now let's read this. It says, It is too true that reverence for the house of God has become almost extinct what does that mean extinct what does that mean it's gone God says well it's gone does God condemn us because it's gone what does he do educate it's almost extinct sacred things are placed are not sacred things and places are not discerned let's read this together the holy and exalted are not appreciated Is there not a cause for the want of fervent what? Piety Piety in our family. Is there not a reason for this? It says, is it not because the high standard of religion is left where? Trailed in the dust. God gave rules of order. Now, do you know that when we have reverence, it leads to order. We're going to talk about organizing. It says, God gave rules of order, perfect and exact to his what? Now, give me a man in the Bible who went out of the due order of God. Anybody know a man in the Bible like that? Uzzah. 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 You remember what he touched that he shouldn't have touched? Mm-hmm. Now, can you imagine? Do you know that one of those rules of order, if you start going through, do you know that, no, that, that as it goes through, that, let me read it. It says, his, has his character changed? Of course not. He's the Lord, he changes not. Is he not the great and mighty God who rules where? In the heavens. In the heavens. Would it not be well for us often to do what? Read the directions given by God himself to the Hebrews. Now, do you know that if you start going through the Bible, God gave words and instructions and counsels of how we were to behave ourselves when we came into his presence. Let me tell you one. We sing a song about it. We used to anyway. 
The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent. Do you know the Bible says that God is in his holy temple? Let all the earth keep silence. Do you know that one of the things that shows reverence for God is that when we recognize he's there, we stop carrying on communications with everybody else except for God. That, that our minds are trying to hear what thus saith God to us. It says... Even to be more thoughtful and reverential in our worship than had the Jews. But an enemy has been where? To destroy our faith in the sacredness of what? Christian Christian worship. The matter has been sadly neglected. Its importance has been overlooked. And as a result, disorder and irreverence has become prevalent. And God has been what? When the leaders in the... Who did God start with? Leaders in the church. Ministers and people, and then what? Fathers and mothers have not elevated the views of... So what is one of the things that has to happen to the church? Not only must the church take root, we must learn to fear God. We must learn to do what? Which means to, to experience what? Talk to me, somebody. To experience reverence. It says... They, it says, have they not elevated the views of the matter? What could be expected of the inexperienced what? Children. In other words, if our children are irreverent, it's only a reflection that we ourselves are irreverent, but we know how to hide it. Mm-hmm. See, there, there's a reason why that we're talking to you, Maya, week by week and talking about reverence. And why your families are talking to you about reverence, or at least we should be talking about reverence, is because our children are the fruit of us. Mm-hmm. So a church member... Whether he has children or not, a church member, if he's going to have influence, must learn the importance of what? Fearing God, which takes in reverence for God. Do you understand? Now listen a little further. They are too often found in groups where? Away from the parents who should have. Now, one of the responsibilities of a parent is not simply to come to church and fellowship with everybody else. It's not even to come to church and only listen to the message. Do you know that it's a responsibility of parents to come to church, listen to God, but also keep a guard on their children. A charge on those who are under their influence. Now, watch what he goes on to say. Who should have charged with them? Notwithstanding, they are in the presence of what? God. And his eye is doing what? Looking Looking upon them. And yet they are light and trifling. They do what? Whisper and laugh and are careless, irreverent. And what else? So then when a child turns around all over the place, what is the work of the parent? Just to pretend like they don't see the child? What is the work of the parent? Lovingly, child. Let's keep our eyes focused. Now, does it start on Sabbath? Where did it start? At home. At home. Now, but what if the parent is not focused? What can they do? If the parent is not focused, can they influence the child? Yes. They cannot. If the parent is not focused, can they influence the child? No. So every member of the church must think in their mind, first, Lord, I want to understand what reverence is. And I want to learn how to practice it in the house of God. I want to learn how to practice it to God himself. And in my own family, learning what it is because I cannot teach something that I'm not trying to do. And I cannot do something that I do not. Mm -hmm. Now, do you know that God does not condemn most parents? You know why? Because most parents themselves have never been taught by ministers who were really should have been taught from the word of God God himself. But we can all go back to the Bible ourselves. It says, do not have so little reverence for the house and worship of God as to communicate with one another when? During the sermon. If those who commit this fault could see the angels of God looking upon them and marking their doings, they will be filled with shame and abhorrence of themselves. God wants what? So what is the work of the parent? Lord, teach me how to be an attentive hearer so that I can in turn teach my children how to be an attentive hearers. <clears throat> Excuse me. It says, God wants attentive ears. It is while men slept that the what? Enemies. 
that the enemy so tears. Now I want to tell you something as we get ready to close. Go to Hebrews 2 as we go to our final text for today. Go to Hebrews 2. Go to Hebrews 2. Hebrews the second chapter. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews the second chapter. Now we're going to do something different. I, I, I plan on doing something else, but I'm telling you, God took control of what I'm going to tell you today. So I, we, did, we, <coughs> we did something different than what we were planning on doing. But God is trying to rebuild us. And in rebuilding us, I don't know about you, but I, we've had a talk in our family. And I told our family, I, I said, you know, it's possible that we have a careless view of what reverence is. And when I look at our home, somebody says, oh, well, as long as you just don't talk in church, you're reverent. But that's not, that's not itself reverence. You know that reverence includes not only our actions, but reverence includes our attitude. Do you know that, that, that we can never say a word in worship and still be irreverent? Mm -hmm. I was telling our family, I said, as a family, praise God if he's called us not to say this or that, but, but that's not enough. And I don't know about you and your family, but we have to start studying what actually reverence is. Mm -hmm. Do you know that right now, that if a child is not obedient, he's not reverent? Mm -hmm. You know that reverence leads to obedience. Mm -hmm. Fear God and give what? Now, you know, glory, we, we don't, well, I'm going to show you from the Bible that the Bible says that true fear in God is when we stand in awe. We are awe of God so much, the Bible says, stand in awe and sin not. That it is the fear of God that produces this awe that we say, awesome God, wonderful God, how can I sin in God's presence? But if we don't fear God, we'll never stop sinning. And that's what the Bible says, fear God and give glory to him. Well, what, what, all have sinned and come what? Do you know that, that I will never stop sitting unless I first learn to fear God? And this is something that has been almost extinct in seven Adventist churches. I'm going to tell you something. One of the saddest or greatest experiences, if you want to test reverence, is what happens after church. That's one of the greatest tests of reverence. If after worship or church, you finish, and all of a sudden, everybody is all over the place. And instead of, when they're leaving, remembering what God has said, meditating on what God has said. And when we talk to each other, we talk about what God has said. God has spoken. And if he hasn't spoken, then something's wrong. But if God has spoken, we should be encouraging our child. When we talk together, let's talk about what has God talked to us about. Make it simple for the little child to understand. Talk to him about it when you go home, as you're driving, as you're going through. It should be that the last thing on our minds is the words that came from Christ himself. Do you know that when Jesus left the Passover, when he was 12 years old, that one of the things that everybody was doing, everybody was getting all caught up and in, in, in fellowshipping with each other, that they forgot about the children and they forgot about Jesus. And they got so caught up, and Jesus did not want to be in that presence. Jesus looked at the Passover, and in the sanctuary, he understood that all of that prophetically pointed to his mission. Yeah, that's right. And now he was convicted. That's my life. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm supposed to be living. Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to give my life a sacrifice. Dear God, Father, prepare me for this. And he's meditating on this mm -hmm. as he leaves at 12 years old. And when he leaves... Everybody else is caught up in everything else. Oh, they, 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 can you imagine Mary? Mary saying, what are they going to have for supper? What do we make? Susie comes over to Mary. Not probably her cousin. Susie comes over and says, oh, okay, Mary, what, what robe? Where did you get your robe today? Where would you buy that robe? Nice robe. You think that's how they were talking? Yes, they were talking just like that. Nothing new under the sun. But Jesus did not want that company. You know what Jesus did? He stayed back. And he meditated with God, praying, Lord, I want to focus on what my mission is and I want my life to be totally surrendered so that this week will be different. It won't be the same. When Jesus did that, they lost him because everybody else was look, focused on everything else. Do you know that we're doing the same thing today? How do we leave church? What's on our mind? What are we talking about? Now, my brother and sister, if our church is going to change, so they can become the light of the world? A new form of reverence has to be introduced. A new form of talking as we interact with each other, encouraging one another. Did you have a, a rough time this week? Let's pray about it. 
Let's encourage each other. Let's encourage the children. Let's not forget what's happening among our families. And now, my brothers and sisters, this type of reverence, everybody's not going to like it. But it's going to weed out sin from our hearts. Did you notice what I said? It's going to weed out what? Sin from our hearts. And if we want to hold on to it, then it will weed us out. Do you know that this is the reason why many left Jesus? Now, my brothers and sisters, time is too short for you and I to play games anymore. We've been here for a little while, but we've been, we've just, we've just, been, we've just been playing. We've been touching the surface. This week beginning, by the grace of God, we're saying, Lord, you've got to cause a difference to happen to me and my house. And if it's going to happen, it's going to start by saying, I want to learn what it means to reverence God. I encourage you. There's a chapter in volume five of the testimonies. What chapter? Volume five. Oh, excuse me, I didn't say a chapter. But what testimonies? Volume five of the testimonies. The chapter is called Behavior in the House of God. Behavior in the House of God. Volume five of the testimonies. Behavior in the House of God. I would encourage each of us. We're going to do a special thing in our family. This week, we're going to read that chapter as a family. I encourage you to do the same thing in your home. I promise you, if you read in your home, you will come back next week by the grace of God and you will say, I understand now, Lord. I understand. There has got to be a change. This cannot continue this way. And I promise you, if this happens in our church, God's presence will so fill the church that power will come to us when we're in the church. The power of the Lord will be present to heal us every Sabbath. And when Gentiles come or non-converts come or others in the world come, they will come in and they will come in and be like, what in the world is this? I'm going to tell you something. I remember when, 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 when the message first reached me, the minister of God, he believed in reverence. And I remember the first time I walked into the building when the message was preached, it felt like angels were in the room. I mean, literally like angels were there that, that, that they had left heaven and came into that room. I, I didn't study, I wasn't really a, a deep student in the Bible. When I came in, I felt God's presence. There were things that the minister never even had to say that I never wanted to do because I recognized God is here. We have lost the sense of what it means to be in God's presence. But brothers and sisters, God wants us to come back to that place. What do you say? Amen. I want to come back. Volume 5 of the Testimonies, what chapter? Behavior. Behavior. In the house of God. I want you to read that. Now, we broke up in the teams last week. We're not going to do it today. We're, we're going to Hebrews 2. We're getting ready to close. We broke up in the teams last week. Uh, who was the first one who's going to start presenting? Who's the first one? Team what? Team number one. Are you ready for it, uh, to do your presentation? You're not going to do it today, but are you ready for the presentation? Yes, You're in position. All right. Now, here's team one. Now, please exchange numbers before it's over with. I don't know. Have you, have you, did you get each other's number? Did you get their number yet? I know you weren't here last week. But you... Uh, you know, well, praise the Lord. We got one more week. You got one more week. Praise the Lord. So now we're going we to get together and, and, and Brother Bill, we're all on this one team together. Now, you're going to be leading out in it, but each person, you get together and learn how you're going to do it apart. Brother Bill's going to be reading that text from Luke 12 the next time. And then you're going to work together. Are you following? All right. Everybody's in position. All right. Who is going to be the second team? Now, we don't have to do it in order. We don't have to do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Anyone who is ready with their question, because we've already studied it, anyone who wants to go, you can go next. Now, if you don't go, then I'll assign you. Amen? <laughs> Someone said, I know, I'm just not going to ask. But no, no, if you don't go, I'm going to assign you. All right, who, who wants to go next? You want to go next? I believe that, by God's grace, that we can get at least three teams in on a Sabbath. How many teams? Three. We're going to try and get three teams in on a Sabbath. Each team will have ten minutes. How many minutes? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Each team will have 10 minutes. Now, if you finish it before 10 minutes, that's good. But there will be a limit of 10 minutes. And so if you need, if you need uh, help uh, in, the, in, in answering that question by the grace of God, you try, you do what you can, and then you have opportunity to ask questions after your presentation. And we'll go through and make it clear. Yes, yes. Now, we, 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 we're going to start, start, start with 10 minutes. 
We're going to start with 10 minutes. Now, we might, depending on, depending on, how, so de, depending, depending on how you do with the 10 minutes, we might extend some, some grace. Amen? Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll look at 10 minutes. because we, See, sometimes you answer one question. Now, sometimes we go through 30 questions. Are you following what I'm saying? One question, you can do it in 10 minutes. You can do it. And so by the grace of God, we want to just uh, take that. Now, if in it, that means if you didn't, that means you still have sap and you got to boil it down and turn it into maple syrup. Now, you follow? <laughs> and that's what we're doing. And all of us are learning to do that. Amen? Amen. All right. Now, uh, so who wants to do a second? Who is, is, did we say team two? What, what, what team? I'm, team I'm excuse me, not team two. Team eight will be the second one. And who wants to be in number three? Who's going to be in third? Because we're going to try to put three slots in. Uh oh. <laughs> that about to be a revolution. <laughs> I that I don't want no, 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 no. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. All right. Well, you, you, need, you, need, you need to talk. You need to be, you need to be talked back together before. All right. Who's going to be on the third? Who's going to be in the third place? Ten, team 10. All right. So that will be, that's team, team five, five, team eight, team and, eight and team 10. And team 10. And that will be question, who, team five has what question? One. one. Team eight has what question? question three. three. And team 10 has what question? Question two. Question two. Thank you. Thank you, scribe. <laughs> All right. Now, like say again. Would you, like our names? You, you, you have your names? We do. You have your names? Yes. All right. Look, look, let's get the name now. Not for everybody. We, we, everybody, before you do it, you'll get a name. What's the name of team five? Team Salvation. Team Salvation. <laughs> That's a good name. What do you say, Brother Tim? Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> what do you say, Brother Bill? Amen. Amen. Team Salvation. All right. So everybody's in agreement with that name? Amen. Carry it. All right. Team Salvation. Who is Team 8? Team What's your name? CIA. CIA. Well, no, no, no. We can't let in. in. Nobody, nobody for the government. Nobody going to be. Uh, uh, okay. Okay, that's what I said. That's what I said. Now, wait a minute now. They, 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 the FBI and the CIA. Christian in action. Christian, Christian in action. Amen. All right. Do, do we agree with that, Team 8? Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Team number 10. You were not prepared with the name. Now, now, now you, we're getting practice, though. Do you know that the inspiration actually says that whenever we do missionary work, that we should work under a name. Inspiration tells us that. So that when we're actually going to the community, there's supposed to be a name that we go into the community with. Now, we have a name that we're going to the community with very soon. No. I'm not going to tell you right now, though. <laughs> but we, we have some things prepared for us. We're getting ready to take over, by God's grace, this community. Amen. But first, we've got to put together a team. And everybody has to make the cut. And... Somebody is not always going to make a cut if we don't plan ourselves somewhere. You understand? Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's everybody. That's everybody. Now, does that, if, we, if, if we're not on the team here, does that mean that we've done something evil? No. no, it does not. We have to know where God has placed us. But I'm serious when I'm telling you this. I'm serious. I don't care what we do. We have to plan ourselves somewhere. Mm-hmm. I promise you. And it may not be here, but you got to pray yourself somewhere. Now, if you're not here, you're not evil, you're not doing something bad, God is leading a, a, a person. If we pray to him and ask God for guidance, God will guide us. But he's going to guide us to plant ourselves somewhere. And so my brothers and sisters, wherever it is, so if you see somebody not here, don't go around and say, oh, that person did something evil. I, I knew they were going to cut. That's not what God is doing. That's not the attitude. All of us should be encouraging one another. All of us should be praying for one another. All of us should be happy for one another. But we've got to develop a local team here. Mm-hmm. And to develop a local team here, it's got to be somebody that's going to be consistent that we can count on every week. Mm-hmm. Unless there's an emergency. And that's not bad. But that's what's going to happen if we're going to grow this church. Do you want to, do you want to grow with this church? Yeah. This is how it's going to happen. And by God's grace, we're going to work with you. And anyone who is, is there visiting, we're going to have a good time too. But growing is what we're talking about right now. That's what I'm focused on. And developing us like God wants us. So, all right. Uh, so, n- n- name. So, next week, by God's grace, you need a name. Now, I'm going to come to Gianna. I'm going to say, did they, give, did they give a name? 
make sure you encourage them. When, when tomorrow comes, say, family, we got to choose a name. Did we choose a name? <laughs> Olivia, say, mommy and daddy, did we choose a name? <laughs> did we choose a name? And when worship is over, did we choose a name? Yeah, can we choose a name? <laughs> and come up with a name. I'm telling you, look, we're getting ready to have some fun. Amen. We're going to really enjoy ourselves. Amen. God is getting ready to put together family teams that we're going to understand what to do. Amen. Now we're we'll getting a name. All right. So uh, next week when we come back, next week when we come back, we're going we're gonna to get ready. We'll have prayer. Uh, we'll do a, a brief introduction, maybe five minute introduction, and then our teams need to be ready. All right? And we're going to try to take in these three teams. And then we'll leave the rest for question and answer. So upon these teams, you might have questions when you went through this. And so I didn't understand this part. I didn't know how to express this. So I didn't understand that. Or I did. We'll make sure that we have opportunity to do that. And if we don't have any questions, then we'll leave church early. But this, this, this is going to be this is what we're doing. We'll make sure that we'll just do this. And we're preparing for something. You see, one of the times we're going to find out, I'm, I'm letting something out of the bag. I'm letting something out of the bag. <laughs> But we're going to get ready to set up where once a month we're going to come, not even for a service to preach or teach, but a service to come together and then go into the community. Amen. Amen. And then when we come back, we're going to testify of what God did for us. Amen. That's going to be the service. Amen. I'm going to show you that that's biblical service. Okay. But most churches don't do it. But this is what's going to give us power. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the way they did preliminaries. No. By the word of their testimony. We're going to have a, a, where we'll come together and we're going to actually walk through these streets. We're going to go from door to door. We're going to take a lesson of what we're going to do. We're going to teach what, how to knock on doors. How to reach souls. And then we're going to testify. You're going to find out that there's nothing like serving God in the community. Amen. It's going to be so sweet when you come back. People who thought, I never could say anything. I remember people who couldn't read doing this when we were in different churches and we were over. And as they went out and they did this, I couldn't believe what God has done and gave them courage. Amen. God's going to do the same thing for us. Amen. Person who said they can't teach. Person who said they, can't, they don't have ability, they're shy. All of that disappears Amen. under the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hebrews 2 as we close. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Are you excited, brothers and sisters? Yes. I'm excited. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to contain myself. I can't wait to hear the students here at BTI. Now, now those who are watching BTI where you are, we're going to cut this part off. You're not going to see this part. You're not going to see this part. This is private. This is, this is personal. It's almost like when you're doing, a, <clears throat> when you're doing a, a colonic, you don't want everybody watching you. That's personal. When you're doing some of the works, uh, you, that's personal thing. So sometimes you might mess up. You may not want that all over the world. You know, you, 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 you may not want that all over the world. So we're not going to do that. We're not going. We're not going to embarrass nobody like that. So this is going to be private. We're going. We're going to stop. We're going to stop the BTI there. And if you are wherever you are in the nation, in the world, you're doing BTI. You must set up in your houses your classes. You must choose your names. You must get into position yourselves and become a jet of light. And so we're going to stop that and you can stop the recording and you start doing your class for 10 minutes and then put the recording back on. <laughs> Amen. So every one of us, we're going to do it privately here and you'll be able to ask whatever question you have. You'll be able to say, well, I, I understood that, but not that. I'm not comfortable with this. And by God's grace, we're going to get you comfortable. Amen. I remember the first time, I'm going to tell you something, Brother Bill, when I got converted, first time that I went home and I lived in a, a, a bad part of town and I said, I want to start witnessing for God. And I said, I want to go door to door. And I came to my father, and I knew he had done some work before. And I said to him, I said, Father, I don't know what to say if I'm going to go to a house. What do I say? And he said, son, I'm going to tell you something. Wise in his counsel. He said, son, if you knock on the door, you're going to have to say something. <laughs> he, he didn't tell me what to say. He didn't tell me how to say it. Now, I'm not going to do that to you. He that wins souls is wise. We're going to actually study what to say, Amen. how to say it, Amen. position ourselves and be rightly trained. But my brothers and sisters, he was right. And when he was sincere, I went to that first door. <coughs> I, I, I remember the first time 
I knock. And a person came to the door. I'm standing there with a Bible in my hand. I had never been in a door like this before in my life. Young man, I, I just, I'm here to study the, oh, you all right, baby? <laughs> Praise the Lord, there was an older saint. It was older. And you know, the older saints, they know how to be merciful to you. Now, I'm merciful you. Baby, you all right? You need some water? Yes, I need some water. <laughs> need some water. I'm here to study the Bible with you. It, 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 was a, it was almost seemed like complete failure. Uh -oh. But see, in our minds, we don't understand that failure is a part of success. Amen. Amen. When you think about the making of a light bulb, you know how many times it took before the light bulb was actually developed? Thousands. But you only know that one time the light bulb was made. <laughs> you think about the Wright brothers who flew the airplane. You say, oh man, they, they didn't get it right the first time. You know how many thousands of times they crashed? But you don't hear about all those thousands of times. If we're going to succeed, we must be willing to fail. And fail miserably. It's flat on your face. And forget about it. I'm going to tell you something. Second door, I'm not going to tell you it was a miraculous experience and all of a sudden, golden tongue came upon me. <laughs> Silver tongue or no, no. Blah, 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 blah. But as the third door came, development started, and I began to start seeing, oh, I'm here to study the Bible with you. I'm here to talk to you about the love of God, and I see that Jesus is coming back soon. Do you see the signs? Do you know there are certain signs? Yes. Well, let me show you. Look, and we're going to study right now. Amen. Now, this is at the beginning. There are better and more effective ways, and we're going to talk about what those effective ways are. But God will take us step by step. We learn how to swim, not on land, but in the water. Can you imagine right now we came to a swimming class and we're doing like this? <laughs> and we're just in the air. We're not going to swim too good like that. Because you get into the water, guess what's going to happen? You're going down. You're going down, buddy. <laughs> you learn how to swim, not on land. Guess where you learn how to swim? In the water. You know how you learn how to give Bible study? By giving Bible study. And you know what you're going to do next week starting? You're going to give some Bible study. And we're going to start within first. God always starts within before he goes without. We're going to learn how to study within. Amen? Amen. Hebrews 2 as we close. Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2nd chapter, Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. <coughs> Let's read that together. The Bible says, Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we shall let them slip. We're getting ready to leave church. I'm, a, I'm, I'm not going to be tempted. Listen to me. Don't let what we said slip today. Jesus is getting ready to come. What's happening in 2025 plus or minus is real. What the government is preparing is real. Uh-uh, Michael, uh-uh. A good way, let, let, me sh let me show you right now as a church, a young people, I want, you I want you to see something here. A good worship position, if you're not taking notes, a good worship position is to fold your hands. Let me see, let me see a young person fold their hand. Let me see you fold your hand. Let me see it, very good. See a young person fold your hand. Olivia, let me see you, very good. Good worship position is to fold our hands. When we're not taking notes, if we're taking notes, take a pen, write, that's okay. But we finish, a good position is to fold our hands. A good, tell me, is, is a good worship position just slouching like this? Is that a good worship position? How should I sit if I'm in a good worship position? You know, the Bible says that God inclines his ear. You know what a recliner is? A chair. You know what a recliner is? How's the chair? How's a recliner chair? Well, I sit back. God doesn't recline when we pray. Can you imagine? God said, I recline my ear when you talk to me. That'd be God getting away from us. But an attentive ear, they're leaning almost forward. You can see them on the, on the edge of their seats. Trying to hear what thus saith the Lord. A good worship position is sit up with hands and notes. If we're taking pink, pink, uh, a pen, paper, Bible, if we're not taking notes, fold it. But not all over the place. Now, is God upset when a child does not learn that? No, God's not upset. 
God is trying to teach us how to behave ourselves in the house of God. Now, you want to be reminded of this every day. You may have to remind a child a hundred times. It's all right. You can do it patiently and lovingly. But if you do it enough, you know what's going to happen? It's going to turn into a habit of the heart. If you pray, Lord, give me reverence. Help me to be attentive to your words. Give me a greater love for you than anything else. You know that when we do something we like, we're attentive. Someone says, oh, the child has ADD. You know what ADD stands for? <coughs> and you put a video game in front of them. No ADD. I mean, that child, focus! He will sit there for hours. You put a television in front of a child. I've seen it. You put it there, you, you, right now, it's almost like a magnet. You put it, <laughs> the face just a, even a baby that's not even a, a year old, you put that television in, and they design it that way. When we have a time, we're going to talk about who to develop the television. We're going to talk about scientifically how the television was made. You know, the, sci the television was made scientifically to get your attention. It's made that way. You're, it's, not, it's not the nature of the television with its movements are designed to attract the eye. And we need to know that because if you go into a house to do Bible study and their television is on, can you imagine you're sitting out and you're trying to do Bible study and you're watching television with them? <laughs> now, you think I'm joking, but I, I, I'm in Bible work and seeing this happen. Another Bible worker watching the television. Do you know that if we're taking our children with us, that we can go to a house and our child is with us and the, the television is on and the child starts watching the television, what witness is that? But you know what witness will be if the television is on and the child is not interested. Yeah. It's focused on the word of God. It would look supernatural. Yeah. And it would be. Yeah. It would be. But it's not going to happen if we don't start practicing this on Sunday and Monday and Tuesday before we go into the community. Yeah. We got to do this now. You understand what I'm telling you? Yeah. Everybody's going to be a part of this team? Well, it's, 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 be, it's between God and us. But I want to be a part of this team. Amen. Amen. And I want to finish this work, brothers Amen. and sisters. But we've got to be careful. Now, when we leave, please, when we leave church today, let's think about what we heard. Reverence. What chapter in Testimonies? Five. Volume 5, Behavior in the House of God. Please read it this week. I'm going to ask you about it next week. <clears throat> read it this week and you'll see what we're talking about. It's it's going to, I'm telling you, you will be convicted. You will say, have mercy upon me, Lord. I didn't know. I mean, it might, it might draw literal tears from your eyes. <clears throat> literal tears. To say, that's not how we are, Lord. That's not how we are. Please forgive me. But if we do this, God's presence will come in. Amen. When we leave here, let's not just talk all over the place. When we do talk, nothing wrong with fellowshipping. But let's do it in a reverent way. How was your week? What can we pray about? What did you, we hear today? What can we put into practice? Talking with our children. Don't just let them run all over the place. But guiding the child and how they're to be as we leave. If we have that type of an experience, we, by God's grace, can learn what it means to be in the presence of God. Let us pray. I'm going to tell you something. I, I did not plan to say exactly what we said today. Know that God is speaking to us. I mean, God is talking. If there's someone here, I want to make an appeal. <clears throat> there's someone here that says today, Lord, I want to take what I heard serious. First, I want to become a teacher, but I can't teach what I don't do. And I can't do what I don't know. And I can't know unless I come to you, dear God, to teach me. And one of the first things you want to teach me is reverence. Someone here today that says, Lord, I want to read volume five of the testimonies this week. Behave in the house of God and learn a little bit more about reverence this week. And I want God to help me and my family. I want you to raise your hand if you want God to help you and your family. You want to make a commitment this week. Praise God. Praise God. You want to make a commitment number two. You want to know where is the place that God wants you to be planted? 
Because God is going to plant you somewhere. God's a gardener. He's not going to leave you as a bare root. A tumbleweed. That's no plan of God. And so if you say, Lord, it may not be here, but wherever you're going to lead me, help me to take your counsel serious as a family. We must take root somewhere and connect ourselves with the local church. That you're going to make that a matter of prayer. And say, Lord, where would you have me? If that means a change in my program, then change my program. If that means radical change, radical change. But this is God's plan. It may not be here, but it's wherever God leads you. Pray, Lord, this week I'm going to ask my family, where's the local church? Ask nice God and my family together, where should we be locally as a family? Talking to God. And number three, that you want to take root and let God transform us from the inside out. That's your desire today? Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, we're lifting our hands because we need you, Lord. We can't do any of this by ourselves. But if we will make this decision, not only will you change us in our homes, but you will so convert this church that when unbelievers walk by, they will feel your presence and be drawn inside of this building, this church, to find Jesus Christ. And so, Father, please, as we leave this place, help us to remember what we heard and to leave reverently and respectfully. We thank you, Lord. Bless our children and our families. Keep us, strengthen us, and bring us back refreshed next week according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.